Now, the latest ITV news from Granada Reports in the Northwest. Hello, a very warm welcome to Granada Reports. Hello there. On the programme this evening. The call for no more young lives to be lost and no more funerals as mourners say a sad farewell to 28-year-old Ashley Dale, shot dead in Liverpool. It isn't good enough to say this was an accident. Liverpool really needs to be standing together now and saying enough is enough. When Charles went to Morecambe, how the young people there now want him to speak up for people like them as our new king. Meeting in the most difficult circumstances, Travis, who survived London's Westminster Bridge terror attack, joins us live to tell us about the chat he had with Charles III. It really is rocket science. We'll be meeting the expert from Warrington who's bringing the old photos of the lunar landings to life. And there's a gentle autumnal theme to the weather at the moment, but we do have a bit of heavy rain ahead of us this week. The forecast is coming up. So please stay with us and that report from Liverpool is coming up shortly. But first, to our new king, and Charles III has already said he won't be as outspoken as he was when he was Prince of Wales. But some young people that we've been speaking to in Morecambe want the king to speak up for them on issues they think are important, like climate change and the LGBTQ plus community. Prince Charles, as he was, visited Morecambe in the summer, meeting representatives of his beloved charity, the Prince's Trust. Our correspondent Rob Smith retraced his steps to see what kind of king they hope he'll be. You just need to have a, a good head for heights, really. <laughs> yeah. Inspiration to reach for the top as part of a charity founded by the king. Firefighters in Morecambe work with the Prince's Trust to develop young people's job skills and leadership qualities. The then Prince of Wales witnessed what the scheme can do at this very fire station just two months ago. Bruce, as now his world, all our worlds have changed. Teenagers on the course today want the new monarch to speak up for and speak out on human rights. After the Queen's death, I think it should be a priority to actually make things good again, because like the world just needs to be a better place, really. And I think changes like small things can start just by someone making their mind up about something. Just someone who can try to help the community, really, and voice out on the little problems that us people as a society have. Cafe worker Amelia Bruciani served the king ice cream back in July. She understands the monarch doesn't express opinions, but she and her family are convinced a shift is coming. He's watched it for his whole life and I think he's just going to go and do it. Going to make a difference? Yeah. It would be interesting, especially about the climate and how, how we need to going forward what we need to do to save save the planet because he talks a lot about the climate yeah yeah the queen in the past has never been directly involved but but that's just i think it's this this time for a bit of change i think you know and maybe just not necessarily um what's the word being a politician but but just you know, just getting the word out there the picturesque promenade doesn't hint at the tough times being endured here. Tough times and tough issues some want royalty to recognise. Cost of living crisis at the moment, um, stuff the Queen didn't normally touch on, but obviously everyone's talking about it. You think he could make a difference? He can try. The only problem is when, when a high-profile figure does speak out, he's always popped at, isn't he? He's always criticised for doing right or wrong. But I think he's his own man. He's done a good job so far in his values and what he believes in and just keep doing that. King Charles is all too aware of what he can and can't say, what the Sovereign's role does and doesn't involve. Just because we know what some of his views are doesn't mean he'll act on them in future. Rob Smith, ITV News, Morecambe. Well, joining us now is someone who, at a very traumatic time in his life, met the new king. Yeah, we're pleased to welcome to the studio tonight Travis Frayne from Darwin in Lancashire. 
Five years ago, when he was 19, Travis found himself caught up in that terror attack on London's Westminster Bridge. A car was driven at him and other pedestrians. Four people were killed and 50 injured before the attacker went on to kill a police officer outside Parliament. And while Travis was recovering in hospital, he had a visit from the then Prince Charles. Travis, thanks so much for joining us. You spoke to him at some length, didn't you? Yeah, we um, so so the prince um, came to visit us, and uh, we spent about fifteen twenty minutes together chatting. Actually, and it was uh, you know it was a very intimate chat. We um, had originally been told that the media would come in and would film it, uh, would film it live to go out on television, but as he came through the doors of the the ward in which I was staying, he actually closed the doors and and asked them to stay outside. So we were able to have quite a private chat, which you know I. I Deeply appreciated because there's a lot of pressure on you when uh, you know you mere days after an attack like this. And how much did that chat help you in your recovery? Well, it's yeah. I mean, it's something that I think we we often uh, underestimate because the simple nature of just visiting someone in hospital doesn't seem uh, all that great. But the time that I spent with him actually was really uh, you know quite incredible. I mean, I had only been to London once before the attack had happened um, and I was now in a hospital bed in a city that was uh, was alien to me it wasn't something that I was used to hell before the attack I hadn't even uh, broke a major bone before and now obviously I had this range of injuries um, my mum had only just arrived at the hospital that morning actually uh, the morning of the visit so to see what in many ways was as bizarre as it sounds a familiar face someone that you of grown up seen on television, someone you're aware of and you know of, was actually very, very beneficial for me. And I, I thought that the visit itself um, was very kind and we were incredibly grateful for his, uh, his generosity in visiting us at that time. So it was almost like a friend coming to see you <laughs> because you felt that you knew him a bit like everyone felt they knew the Queen. That's why a lot of people felt so sad yesterday. Exactly, and I think you know there's a, there's a huge void that that remains to be filled now by, by the new king. Um, and I have little doubt personally, little qualms, that he'll be able to fill that, that gap with the same respect and dignity that the queen did. Um, and I certainly think that that is the beauty and, and in many ways the benefit of having a monarchy um, in our country uh, in the 21st century. It's having someone who is emblematic of the nation itself and able to demonstrate that to to anyone who's in an incident like this what else impressed you about him well I mean I I was quite touched by uh, his empathy and I know that again may seem obvious um, at the end of the day he is only a human being um, but we were in the hospital bed and I remember towards the end of our our chat I asked for a, a photo actually I was quite cheeky um, and in doing so, I remember the lighting was really poor in the hospital bed and obviously with the range of injuries that sustained, I, I couldn't sort of move around and switch the lights on and everything myself and he was completely helpful, you know, he was like turning on the lights for me and we got a photograph and I think most notably actually, on the way out of the ward uh, as he was leaving, now I, I was sharing a ward with, um, with other people who had serious injuries but who were not affected by the attack. Um, and I know that he had a, a brief chat with, um, with the mother of one of the other patients in our ward who was very badly injured. And in doing so, uh, you know, inquired about uh, the, the kid's well-being. And we later found out a few days later that he wanted to remain in touch with them. And I believe he remained in touch with them for some months afterwards, inquiring about the kid's well-being. Wow. Travis, that's a really special story. Yeah. It's, uh, it's yeah. lovely to hear. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining us and telling us about it tonight. Well, now uh, let's go to the funeral of the young woman who was shot dead in Liverpool and that message tonight that the killing has to stop and the funerals have to stop. The Auxiliary Bishop of Liverpool, Beverly Mason, was speaking out before the service for 28-year-old Ashley Dale at the city's Anglican Cathedral. Ashley was described as the shining light of her family. She was shot when she was in the back garden of her home, one of three people killed by guns in Liverpool last month. Our reporter, Tasha Kachiri, was at the service. Saying goodbye to a young woman with so much promise. Ashley Dale's pristine white coffin arrived at Liverpool's Anglican Cathedral. 
friends and family wearing pink to reflect her personality and celebrate her life. On top of the hearse, two words, are ash a sentiment of what she meant to so many. It was a very special service, um, very, very moving. Uh, the cathedral was full of people who've come in to, um, to, to grieve. Uh, there was so much broken-heartedness in the place, uh, but there was also that sense of peace and blessing. Ashley died after a gunman forced open her door and fired multiple shots indiscriminately into her house in Old Swan last month. Ashley graduated university in this very building with so much promise. A few short years later, and this has become the place that her family and friends say goodbye. But what her family are determined to do is remember her how she was, a beautiful, promising young lady with so much to offer the world. I think today what the family really want us to focus on is a celebration of Ashley's life. She was a vibrant, beautiful young woman. She was going far in her chosen career in environmental health with Knowsley Council. They want to really focus not on the manner of her death, but actually celebrate the essence of the spark of life that she had. The fatal shooting came five days after the death of Sam Rimmer in Dingle and less than 24 hours before the murder of Olivia Pratt Corbell in Duffcott. Today, Ashley's friends and family shared memories, cried and held each other close. Many still come into terms with their loss, others calling for something to be done. It isn't good enough to say this was an accident. Liverpool really needs to be standing together now and saying enough is enough. We've seen enough crime. I've taken too many funerals now uh, and grieve with too many family of people uh, whose lives have been snaffled out because of acts of wickedness. And we need to be having an amnesty of weapons. We need to be laying down our weapons out of respect for, for Ashley, for little Olivia, and for the very many others now that are, for, uh, that are forming this shocking list of people whose lives have been snaffled out at the hands of wickedness. So far, eight people have been arrested in connection with Ashley's murder. Seven are now on bail, while the last suspect was released under investigation pending further inquiries. Ashley's death, another blow to a family who have already been through so much. In 2015, her brother Lewis Dunn was fatally shot in another case of mistaken identity. While Ashley's family struggle to come to terms with carrying on without her, those she left behind are urging the city of Liverpool to come together. Tasha Kachiri, ITV News, Liverpool. And as we saw there, Ashley's family have asked for donations to be made in her name to the Ollie Charity, which supports children in difficult circumstances like bereavement or deprivation. There's more information on our website at itv.com slash Granada. The family of a teenager who was murdered in Rochdale have described him as a strong and caring young man. Tributes have been paid to 17-year-old Callum Riley, who was found with serious injuries in the Haywood area on Saturday. Five people have been arrested and police are appealing for anyone with information to come forward. West Lancashire MP Rosie Cooper is stepping down to take up a role in the NHS. She played a vital part in having British Sign Language recognised as an official language, but suffered threats to her life during her time as an MP. She'll now become chairman of Mersey Care NHS Trust, but says it's been an incredible honour to have served the people of West Lancashire. Yeah, we wish her well. And dock workers in Liverpool have walked out in a row over pay and conditions. The strike action will last two weeks. Peel Ports Group, which operates the port, says workers have rejected an offer of an 8% pay rise. OK, lots of reasons to stay with us tonight. Hopefully we won't have to twist your arm. Surely not. We're in Lee with the best arm wrestlers in the land, hoping to outmuscle the rest of the world. And there's a fairly quiet, gentle autumnal theme to the weather for the time being. The next significant rainfall will be Thursday. All the weather details are coming up later on. And here's what's still to come on the ITV News at 6.30 with Lucrezia.
Coming up, the Prime Minister's plans for tax cuts. Will it be enough to ease the cost of living crisis? This trust will set out financial support for businesses and individuals this week, but she admits not all her policies will be popular as she prepares to lift the cap on bankers' bonuses. I'll be looking and the Chancellor will be looking at every measure we can take. And, of course, some measures will be unpopular. Also ahead, the inquest begins into the death of teenager Molly Russell. Did social media algorithms contribute to her death? And after yesterday's royal funeral procession, we speak to the man whose house was the last along the route. Join me for those stories and more at 6.30. Well, back here, we're moving on to sport and the Premier League manager hoping to revive the fortunes of Oldham Athletic, Chris. Yeah, David Unsworth had two caretaker spells at Everton, stepping up from his academy role. But now he gets his first full-time manager's job at Oldham Athletic. He takes over an Oldham side stuck in the bottom half of the National League table. After dropping out of the Football League last season, Unsworth knows the fans demand promotion. I spoke to the players this morning for the first time and I said, the first thing I said to them is promotion is, is achievable this year. Uh, I said, but we won't speak about it again. Um, but I wanted them to know that I felt that was possible. I've wanted to manage for a number of years. Nothing has really got me excited until now. I took a chance by leaving Everton. Um, I, I felt that if I, if I didn't leave, I never would leave. And to come to a club that might get 15,000 fans here next, next week at the first home game is, is just incredible. Well, staying with football and Liverpool captain Jordan Henderson has received a late call-up to England's Nations League squad. The midfielder, who's only played once for England this year, was originally left out with a hamstring injury, but he's recovered in time for the matches against Italy on Friday and Germany on Monday. In cricket, it's been a bizarre first day in Lancashire's penultimate county championship match. They were bowled out for just 131 runs today, but then returned the favour, dismissing Essex for just 107. Lancashire currently 25 for six in their second innings, a lead of just 49. Now, the town of Lee is already known for rugby league and its famous musicians, Pete Shelley and Georgie Fame. But can it also boast the world's strongest arms? Next week sees the start of the World Arm Wrestling Championship in France. So Joe Payne has been to a club in Lee which is ready to go over the top. The world's first official arm wrestling contest took place in California 67 years ago. Now going into the 2022 World Championships, it could be more Wigan Pier than Santa Monica, as this club from Lee go for gold. Well, 25-time national champion. I've been second in the world, third in Europe, travelled the, the globe and uh, always done it for England. Paul Maiden boasts one of, if not the best, arm wrestling portfolio in the country, winning countless matches. But in 2009, his sporting career helped him through a completely different battle. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I was very ill in 2009. I uh, had multiple organ failure. I died three times. And uh, when I lied there in my coma and I'd pretty much lost every bit of muscle I had, um, I was very mentally weak. I was broken. Paul lost 25 kilograms in a month, weight he could only afford to lose thanks to his heavyweight build formed from years of training and competing. Well, I must saved my life, or oh, one million percent. When I was lying there in the side ward, riddled in, in pipes and, and, and breathing apparatus, um, it's the only thing. The only thing that was on my mind was to get back to where I was because I left the sport at that time at the very top. I was unbeatable uh, domestically. And um, all I wanted to do is become that, that guy again. I mean, I remember looking at my arms and they'd lost so much size, I burst into tears. And uh, I just, I miss and saved my life. Since his recovery, Paul's competed again at the top level and founded the Professional Arm Wrestling Association, giving others across the UK and Ireland better opportunities to try and emulate his success, including Aggie Gorzinska, England's current team captain. So, yeah, I'll look around. I found the club in Lee, and literally 10 years ago, nearly, I started my journey. Well, so far, uh, I'm uh, six times British champion, uh, European champion only from this year, uh, world uh, champion as well from 2016, and any other medals follow. 
Aggie and Paul will be hoping those medals follow at the World Championships this month as they join over 50 PAA members heading to Dieppe in France. There's going to be guys from you know maybe 30, 40 countries from around the world and you've, uh, you're basically just pitting it against the best. You've got to lose twice to, to, to go out, so you have got two chances. Uh, I don't plan to lose any. I plan to be coming back world champion. Joe Payne, ITV News, Lee. Yeah, good luck to Paul and Aggie next week. Well, as brothers, you must have arm wrestled a bit. Oh, Who wins? Go. Well, it's him, isn't it? Because he fights dirty. Do you? How very dare you. How outrageous. <laughs> I love this we insight. We will settle this after the programme. <laughs> I love this insight into your growing up. Uh, OK, thanks, Chris. Now, I love questions like this, too. What links the American space agency, NASA, and the town of Colchith near Warrington? Well, you're probably not aware that Andy Saunders from Colchith is regarded as one of the world's foremost experts at digitally restoring images from the NASA space expeditions. He spent years working through thousands of photos and footage of those Apollo moon missions with remarkable results. As Paul Crow reports. Apollo image expert Andy Saunders is on a mission of his own. From his desk in Culchuth near Warrington, Andy has painstakingly enhanced original photos and footage from NASA's moon missions in the 1960s and 70s. His passion from childhood is as clear as the pictures he's transformed. When I learned that actually people have been to the moon, and walked around on the moon, that just absolutely blew my young mind. And I was just obsessed with it. Who were these people? What did they look like? What did the spacecraft look like? What's it like on the moon? If these are the best cameras, the best lenses, the best film, the best photo lab. We should be seeing these in a better state, so why aren't we? Using cutting edge enhancement techniques, the 48 year old has created the highest quality Apollo photographs ever produced. Here we've got what looks like a window and there's a, a little purple square that I recognise as the guidance light that they use so I thought there may be something interesting in this and as we start we can instantly see actually there is a person in there and that's Commander Jim McDivitt on Apollo 9. After this was kind of two or three days work to get all of the detail out to get it to look correct and I just love the fact that we end up with this. He's also produced the first ever clear image of the first man to walk on the moon, Neil Armstrong. I just couldn't believe what I was looking at and what detail I could pull out. There's his face, his eyelid, it was recognised, not only an image of Armstrong, it was recognisably him. So that, it just hit me. It was almost like I'd gone back to 1969 and I was standing in the lunar module looking out of that window at one of the most important moments in history live. Not surprising that his new book, Apollo Remastered, Restoring Humankind's Finest Moments, has become a Sunday Times bestseller. Total, there were 11 manned Apollo missions. Nine went to the moon, six landed, and in total, only 12 men have ever walked on the moon's surface. We're so used to seeing anonymous figures in a puffy spacesuit and a gold visor. Who were the people? So to be able to step on board and actually see them on this incredible journey, look out the windows they looked at, watch as the Earth sinks away into the blackness. What's it like to be on the moon? So I want readers to feel like this is as close as they can get to actually making this journey and stepping on the moon themselves. Photos which are simply out of this world. Paul Croner, ITV News, Culture. Wow. wow. Time for the weather now. Here's Joe. Mum, wet wipes, toilet or bin? Bin. Why? United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Thank you. Very good evening to you. A few glimmers of warm sunshine today. And all in all, the next couple of days will be quite quiet, settled, dry, a gentle autumnal theme to the weather. But a breeze will pick up as we go through tomorrow evening, turning quite windy. And then on Thursday, a spell of heavy rain for the northwest. High pressure keeping things settled for the time being, but making inroads to the northwest of the UK some rain for Thursday. And that will put down quite a bit for our part of the world. A few showers on Friday and then settling down to start the weekend at least. Now back to this evening, for many of us a quiet few hours to come, bits and pieces of cloud around, a few mist patches before dawn. There's a breeze at the coast but inland the wind is falling very light and it should stay dry across the board 
as we go through into Wednesday morning. Temperature wise tonight, maybe eight or nine Celsius in a few rural parts of Cumbria, Lancashire and Cheshire. Other than that, staying in double figures. Tomorrow, the sun will be up at 6.54. It's setting at 7.13 tomorrow evening. Any early mist will lift quite promptly tomorrow morning. And there should be some nice bright or sunny spells around. There's a few showers, though, in the Irish Sea. These will just push into the Lake District as we go through the course of the day tomorrow. Most of us, though, should have a dry day. More cloud building for all of us later on. And by the end of tomorrow afternoon, winds will increase in strength, becoming very gusty for exposed western coasts and up on higher ground by tomorrow evening. Before that, temperatures doing well tomorrow, 19 Celsius, 66 Fahrenheit, our top temperature. Now looking ahead, it will be rather wet on Thursday, a few rogue showers on Friday, then settling down. Saturday starts fine, with showers developing later. Bye-bye. Cleaned up well. United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Thanks, Joe. That's it from us. Goodbye. Bye-bye. and shoulders.